Hello everyone, my name is Hetal Sarbaya. Uh, I work at Abbey South San Francisco. In my current role as an associate director, I lead the protein science and analytical group. My group focuses on characterization of protein therapeutics, including various uh, biophysical, analytical, as well as bioanalytical tools. Today, the topic of my talk is bioanalysis of antibody drug conjugates using mass spectrometry. I'm going to talk about both qualitative and quantitative bioanalysis. The outline of my talk today uh, is here. So I'll start with giving an introduction on antibody drug conjugates, uh, what they are, uh, and then followed by immunoaffinity enrichment in bioanalysis. Can't stress the importance of this topic, so I'll go through that followed by qualitative and quantitative workflows for ADCs, and then I will give examples from both of these assessments and summarize my findings. Antibody drug conjugates are complex entities. They are composed of three different uh, components, uh, starting with the biologic uh, entity, which is an antibody. The antibody could be site-specific or target-dependent. Uh, also, uh, it has to be uh, able to uh, enable this, the conjugation of the linker. Linker is the second component of the ADC. The linker attaches the antibody with the small molecule toxin. The linker could be pegylated, cleavable versus non-cleavable. Lot of different properties of linkers allow uh, proper conjugation as well as enable the release of the small molecule payload, which is the third component. The payload is selected based on different mechanism of actions. Uh, from orostatins to PBDs, uh, DNA damaging payloads, uh, microtubulin inhibitors, a variety of different payloads can be attached to the antibody. The diversity of each of these components can give a lot of different possibilities for ADCs. Uh, we need to confirm identity and integrity of each of these pieces for making sure that we have the best molecule in our hand. Um, and in order to do that, we need a quick and robust method. And what better than using LCMS that can be used to assess all of these properties of the ADCs at different stages. Once the target has been identified, the ADC development requires several different evaluations that need to happen simultaneously and that starts from different antibody constructs. that could be different antibody that can bind to the target differently. And also the constructs can, uh, can have different sites of attachment of the linker drug. It could have number of different conjugation sites depending on the target drug to antibody ratio that is required. It could have different mutations. Uh, the linkers, uh, which is the second component, again, could be cleavable versus non-cleavable. It could have a different cleavage mechanism, uh, the different uh, properties of the linker, like solubility, uh, stability, etc., could play a role in the selection. And then the, lastly, the warhead uh, uh, piece of the ADC could have different potency, mechanism of action, uh, and it needs to have a proper handle for the linker attachment. With all three components uh, in place, uh, you can have multiple different programs from starting from early research through development, which could have a different number of map constructs, warheads, and linkers. And how do you enable selection and filtering of the best ADC candidate starting from early research through development? We use a variety of different screening funnels. Uh, two most important uh, uh, screening funnels that we use are the in vitro killing assay and the plasma stability assay, which measures uh, the stability of the ADC as well as the potency of the ADC before it goes into the in vivo efficacy and PK and TOC studies. Um, I'm going to focus on the plasma stability assay, which is a qualitative measurement uh, as we go through the next uh, slides in the deck. One of the important considerations for antibody drug conjugates is the biotransformations. 
since ADCs consist of three different components, it's very important to understand the integrity and stability of these molecules once they are in vivo. Uh, biotransformation can happen on the uh, small molecule payload as well as linkers, as well as on the antibody itself. And uh, this example that I'm showing on this slide is from Surinder Kaur uh, and Keang Zhu from Genentech. They uh, show very good uh, cartoon here uh, that can tell you about variety of different biotransformation that can happen. You can have adduct formation, metabolites and catabolites. Uh, you can have another antigen and other specific AB binding uh, considerations as well as linkers and payloads. Um, that can change during uh, in vivo studies. So the ADC biotransformation affects the efficacy and safety, and many different uh, ligand binding assays are not basically able to capture these changes. LCM, SMS, uh, for just the free drugs to do not actually represent the changes happening. And hence, you know, we need this molecular microscope uh, to study the ADCs in vivo. So I'll stress upon this because, you know, we need a good LCMS capability in order to monitor small changes. The most important step in any bioanalysis is IP, immunoprecipitation or immunoaffinity enrichment, the enrichment of the target protein from the biological matrix. As an isolation approach, immunoaffinity purification methods are highly effective and capable of achieving a thousand-fold enrichment of the target analyte. Incorporation of these techniques in an LCMS assay is a preferred route to achieve the highest possible sensitivity. These techniques can be divided into three categories. Drug-specific antibodies, peptide-specific antibodies, and other captures such as binding protein target or receptor, etc. In discovery research, uh, we have a fast-paced environment. We need flexible and fit-for-purpose universal assays that can be used as plug-and-play. Hence, we have the generic assay here and the specific assay and examples of application where you can uh, apply either of those. If we have a typical human monoclonal antibody uh, that is going to be dosed in a mice or monkey or going to be incubated in a mice or monkey or rat plasma, you can use a generic assay where you can use a capture, which is an anti-human IgG, and monitor using FC constant region peptides if it is a quantitative assay. If it is a qualitative assay, you can monitor as an intact. For specific assay, you can, you know, uh, the application would be if you have a murinized MAB, which is going to be dosed in a mice. You have to use a target-based capture or anti-IDS, um, and then monitor unique or conserved region peptides. One of the other important aspects of immunoaffinity purification is the amount of the capture reagent to be used. It's very important to understand the right amount of capture reagent. Uh, that can give you the linearity and it is in that range and it does not, uh, you know, without having any saturation effects. Okay, so after enrichment of the analyte from plasma, you can have two potential workflows based on the question you're trying to answer. You could have a qualitative assessment using intact mass platform. The application includes in vivo stability, DAR analysis, intactness of the molecule, biotransformations, etc. On the other hand, the quantitative assessment can be, again, divided into two different approaches using intact LCMS as well as peptide LCMS. And this would be used for total um, analysis of the drugs or targets, concentration in a PK efficacy or a TOC study where you need absolute concentration. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the qualitative assessment. Uh, the typical workflow for qualitative assessment would include affinity purification of the analyte from in vitro and in vivo study followed by either intact, reduced, or subunit analysis uh, using LCMS analysis. It is very important to use high-resolution tof type mass spectrometer to provide high sensitivity, dynamic range, and accurate mass. 
These analyses can help interpret the stability of biotherapeutics, potential metabolites or catabolite formation, uh, modification and biotransformation of ADCs, as you can see here. The upfront workflow for sample purification is done using an Agilent SMAP Bravo automation robot, and this really helps uh, with the reproducibility and robustness of the purification procedure. Uh, I'll talk about the Bruker uh, TOF uh, on the next slide, uh, the importance of using the high-resolution uh, Bruker mass spec. I cannot stress enough the importance of high-resolution LCMS for ADC biotransformation. And the Bruker Maxis to ultra-high-resolution QTOF that we use routinely for all the ADC uh, characterization and bioanalysis really offers key unique features that allows accurate analysis of all these uh, ADCs. The first thing is the full sensitivity resolution of greater than 80,000. This resolution is achieved on both MABs and ADCs compared to a significant drop in resolution with other TOF instruments when al analyzing these large molecules. Second important thing is for native LCMS, uh, it's very important to preserve the molecule while ionization into the source. And Bruker-Toff uh, shows very limited dissociation of non-covalent complex into subunits. Hence, that's another important attribute that we really require when we do native mass spec analysis for the ADCs. The third and most important for the biotransformation is the monoisotopic mass resolution that Bruker provides. Under denaturing condition, we, we can achieve less than 2 ppm mass accuracy for both light chain and heavy chain. This is really unique feature which I don't think any other TOF instruments provides. Uh, this type of resolution, especially for a 60, up to 60,000 mass. Now let me walk you through some of the examples of my work in qualitative analysis of ADCs. In this case here, I'm showing a DAR6 ADC with a linker payload conjugated onto both light chain and heavy chain. Since this was one of the first programs with higher DAR, the question was whether both conjugation sites show similar stability in vivo. And so samples were extracted from Synotox study and using same workflow that was shown in the previous slide for affinity purification mass spec LCMS analysis was applied in this case. The data was acquired and analyzed using the Bruker TOF and the data showed pretty good stability on both light chain and heavy chain conjugation. As you can see here, uh, there are two deconvoluted mass spectrums at different time points. On the left is the light chain conjugation from five minutes all the way down to 504 hours. And on the right is the heavy chain conjugation. You can see the deconvoluted mass intensities plotted show pretty similar profile for both light chain and heavy chain, suggesting there was no difference observed in the stability of the linker drug conjugated on either of the light chain or heavy chain. Similar clearance trend was observed in both. So this technique can be used, as I mentioned before, on in vivo as well as in vitro samples. And this is a good example. You get a pretty good sensitivity right till the last time point of the study. All right, so here I'm showing another example of a bispecific ADC. Um, the profile here is a PK data acquired using an LBA method using two different approaches, a generic method and a specific method. Uh, generic method is just an anti-IgG-based capture uh, detection, and specific method is an antigen bridging assay using LBA. Uh, and we, what we see here between the dotted lines and the dark lines is a difference between the two assays for the same PK study. And the question here was, why do we see this difference? Is the ADC falling apart in vivo? Uh, it was a basic knob and hole construct. So that was the question. In order to answer that question, we applied the affinity purification followed by intact mass uh, for this uh, in vivo samples. A few time points were selected. And uh, we checked the data. The ADC looked pretty integrated. 
So there wasn't any falling off that was observed. We saw light chain with the linker drug and heavy, heavy knob and hole uh, for all the three time points up to 72 hour. Hence the data suggested that the molecule is intact, both the conjugate and the antibody follow the same trend. Uh, later on, uh, there was a big uh, study that was conducted to understand the difference between the two LBA assays. However, the program was ended because the efficacy wasn't observed as, as desired using the bispecific platform. But again, you know, there are these kind of biological questions that arise at every stage, which uh, the methodology really helps identify and uh, provide the solution. Okay, so here I'm showing an example of in vitro plasma stability of an MTI ADC. Uh, it's a microtubulin inhibitor ADC. Two ADCs were made uh, during the early discovery uh, efforts. ADC, ADC A was using an unstable melamide attachment, and ADC B was using a stable attachment. We saw differences in the in vitro killing assay and potency for ADC A versus B. ADC A showed higher potency, however, the ADC B was less potent in the in vitro killing assay. The question was whether there were stability differences between the, these two ADCs before go, uh, putting them in vivo. Hence, the same workflow was used wherein the, these two ADCs were incubated uh, in sinoplasma for seven days at 37 degree temperature and different time points were collected. These samples went through the same affinity purification workflow and the results uh, suggested huge differences in the stability between the two. As you can see, the purple, which is the ADCB, showed pretty good stability using the stable attachment of the linker drug, versus the yellow, which is the ADCA, showed uh, less stabil stability. And hence, uh, we could show that, yes, there were uh, differences in the stability between the two. And even though ADCB showed less potency, uh, later on, it was seen that the efficacy with ADCB was much better than A. So this analysis really helped select the better uh, ADC for in vivo studies. Okay, up till now in most of the examples, you can see light chain and heavy chain uh, for the ADC, one with the one of them with the linker drug. Uh, that is because most of the ADCs made for a DAR2 were cysteine conjugated, hence in denaturing mode, they would fall apart. Uh, this particular example I'm showing here is a site-specific enzyme-based conjugation uh, of the ADC. And hence, we could use this in a denaturing mode without the ADC falling apart. So over here, again, I'm showing the in vitro plasma stability. Uh, and also, uh, we wanted to see the question was if the DAR uh, changes in vitro in the plasma, because this was the first time we applied these site-specific enzyme technology. It was a higher DAR, actually an average of DAR of 2.1. Uh, the target was DAR4, but it wasn't achieved because of some issues in conjugation. So we wanted to see how the DAR distribution was and if it changed in vitro. This ADC, again, was incubated in mouse plasma for up to seven days, and uh, four different time points were collected. Again, using the same affinity purification workflow, this was injected on the Bruker TOF, and uh, even though under denaturing condition, you see pretty good... Uh, resolution at 150 kilodalton around that mass for these ADC. You see a small amount of DAR1, a majority DAR2, and a small amount of DAR3 at time zero. The DAR doesn't change at seven days. You see pretty much the same distribution, and this can be seen by looking at the DAR changes over time on the left graph, as well as monitoring all the three different DARs on the right side the average DAR doesn't change over time in plasma. So this was really a good readout to understand the stability of a different technology of the conjugation uh, for this particular ADC. Here I'm showing an example for the native LCMS. Native LCMS is routinely used for uh, as a analytical method to characterize uh, DAR distribution as well as calculate average DAR. Uh, 
Um, it's a technology that was developed by Shauna Hengel and uh, Seattle Genetics, and uh, it's, it's a great way to look at DAR changes. We wanted to see if we could use this for bioanalysis or apply plasma purified samples on this technique and see what kind of sensitivity we get. Hence, a cysteine-conjugated DAR2 ADC was uh, spiked in plasma and purified using the same um, affinity purification. A lot of method development was done by Claire uh, for this particular workflow to enable good sensitivity. pH changes, different columns, different buffers, uh, mass spec uh, optimization of the parameters on the native mass LCMS. A uh, lot of optimization happened. We also used a uh, lot of help from Guillaume from Brooker, who is really great in helping us with uh, any mass pack related questions. Um, later on, we were able to uh, get pretty good sensitivity. Here you can see we can go from 2 microgram on column on the top all the way to 0.25 microgram on column. We see good linearity as well as uh, no changes in the DAR. Uh, as we go down, because it's very difficult to get the lower DAR. As you go down, you get, lose the sensitivity. However, we were able to successfully achieve 0.25 microgram on column using the native uh, LCMS method. All right, coming back again to this original workflow, we've already gone through all the qualitative assessment examples, and now I'm going to switch gears and show the quantitative assessment examples. First, intact LCMS, followed by peptide. Before we jump into the specific quantitative workflow examples, let's take a step back and look at the industry trends uh, for quantitative bioanalysis. LBA or ELISAs are generally regarded as the gold standard for bioanalysis of large molecule drug research. Of course, because it uh, gives you the advantage of high sensitivity, the effectiveness, and throughput, it also provides very high dynamic range. However, the need to have specific antibody pairs makes the assay development time consuming and costly. Sample dilution, on the other hand, can increase matrix effect and disrupt the equilibrium with the target engagement. You can even have some cross-reactive interference or analyte degradation that could be hard to uh, detect using the LBA. On the other hand, bioanalysts have recognized the power of LCMS technique and its potential as a complementary tool to this traditional immunoassays. It brings the specificity and selectivity along with multiplexing advantage. It does have some downside where, you know, the assay throughput sensitivity uh, as well as the higher reagent requirement sometimes becomes a bottleneck of selecting this technique. Overall, both LBA and LCMS are orthogonal and complementary. And I really like this quote by Joanna Mora from BMS that says that both LBA and LCMS are complement to each other and they are like the musicians in the same band. So we need to utilize both of these techniques uh, as and when needed in a complementary fashion to enable drug discovery for ADCs. Now focusing on the quantitative analysis of biotherapeutics, uh, again I'm mentioning here the intact versus peptide quant method, uh, two different approaches. The bottom up, which is the peptide quant, offers reproducibility, good sensitivity, and simple instrumentation such as the triple quadruple mass spec can be used. It's a routinely used method, however, there are some disadvantages where you know, it of course has this lengthy sample prep. You can lose uh, metabolite information as well as you can sometimes encounter protein inference problems. On the other hand, the top-down method, which involves direct protein measurement, uh, does not have those disadvantages. It has minimal sample prep requirements and it maintains the protein information. The downside here is that you need high resolution uh, sensitive, uh, tough instruments that can provide good accuracy as well as uh, have the resolution to look at all these large charge envelopes. Sometimes you need complex chromatography to separate the proteins. So overall, both methods are used quite routinely. The intact quantitation is not at the stage where the peptide quant is based on the sensitivity that we need. However, 
you know, again, either can be used as and when needed uh, for the right question during the stage of the drug discovery. Keeping those pros and cons in mind for the bottom-up and top-down approach, I had uh, attempted to uh, look at the intact quantitative intact mass method for one of the ADCs here. Uh, this work was presented uh, at ASMS uh, earlier, and this is about looking at light chain and heavy chain quantitation of the ADC. The ADC here was a cysteine conjugated TAR2, uh, where the linker drug was conjugated on the light, cha light chain. And when reduced, you can see light chain with the linker drug and the heavy chain. The standard curves were made from 0.39 microgram per mil all the way to 100 microgram per mil spiking in sinoplasma. The similar affinity enrichment workflow was used, and the data analysis was done using extracted and chromatograms for the top five chart states on the Bruker Compass software. As you can see here, we get pretty decent uh, charge envelope on the top for the heavy chain and the bottom for the light chain you see pretty good uh, monoisotopic mass resolution for both light chain with linker drug as well as the heavy chain. This is just showing the calibration one. You see pretty good overlay of different calibration curves when you do an extracted ion chromatogram of the top five chart states as indicated by the asterisk marks. All the curves uh, for both light chain and heavy chain using either the deconvoluted uh, mass intensity or the extracted ion chromatogram area provide pretty good linearity and very uh, good standard deviation uh, or CV observed for these uh, measurements. Um, the sensitivity overall, we were able to get the limit of lower limit of quantitation to 0.4 microgram per mil and as I mentioned before, monoisotopic mass resolution. So this was really pretty good uh, compared to what exists in the literature uh, or out there in terms of using TOF instruments for doing intact quantitation. Now let me walk you through uh, some of the examples of the quantitative assessment using the intact mass workflow. Uh, here I'm showing an ADC, ADC-Y, which is an early research stage cysteine conjugated non-cleavable ADC with a DAR of 2. Uh, no reagents are available for an LBA assay for the ADC, which is, you know, because it was using a novel uh, payload. Um, the payload, again, is sensitive to sample pretreatment for a peptide LCMS method. Hence, we cannot use that as an approach. The only way to measure in vivo exposure of the ADC, which is like you know either the conjugated drug or ADC, is using an intact LCMS quantitation. Again, since this was a cysteine conjugated uh, ADC, under denaturing conditions, the ADC falls apart because of the non-covalent bond, you know, getting uh, affected using organic conditions. So, after analysis of the affinity purification, the samples when injected into the Bruker LCMS, you can see light chain with the linker drug and the heavy, heavy timer as uh, the two readouts from the uh, samples. What we did was we used uh, standard curves using the same ADC as well as spiked in uh, an internal standard and looked at the linearity of the curves. As you can see, we got pretty good linearity uh, all the way up to 0.4 microgram per mil. Looking uh, at these uh, linearity and the standard curve interpretation, we looked at the extrapolation from the unknown samples of the PK study, and we saw that the ADC was poor, uh, the stability of the ADC was very poor. The mouse PK uh, suggested that this ADC, non-cleavable ADC, was not behaving as well as the other cleavable ADCs of this using the same payload, which the data I'm not showing here. The further evaluation also suggested that there were some circulating small molecule and metabolite catabolites that were found uh, upon investigation later on.
Okay, here I'm showing another example of quantitative assessment. Uh, this is a non-cleavable ADC, and we used the PK samples to look at the quantitation. Uh, the standard curves were made using the same ADC from calibration standard 1, shown on the left, all the way to the calibration 7. You see the main species here is your light chain with the linker drug plus 18, which is suggestive of the hydrolysis. On the right is the in vivo samples from 4 hours all the way down to the 336 hours. As you can see, the in vivo, the sample is undergoing some biotransformation as suggested using these mass differences. These are changes happening on the warhead that leads it inactive. And as you can see, these are small molecular weight changes, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, and plus 4 on the light chain. And again, this is because of using Bruker mass pack, which offers monoisotopic mass resolution. You can see clearly these small mass changes. And you know these were basically the biotransformations that we were not actually expecting. And looking at this data really helped understand uh, and, and see how the chemists can now take this information to better design the payload to avoid these uh, issues in the future. Coming to the bottoms-up approach, uh, this is the approach using the peptide quantitation workflow. Um, this is routinely used, as I mentioned before, using the triple quad mass pack. Uh, however, it's not as simple as it sounds. There are a lot of considerations that needs to happen before uh, using this assay. Um, you can have the generic approach, as I mentioned before, and specific approach. I will just walk you through some of the key considerations you need to have before developing a peptide quantitative workflow. The first thing is uh, selection of the prototypic peptides and transitions. You need to know the sequence of the molecule you are uh, targeting uh, or quantifying. Select the best prototypic peptides. Um, once that is done, you need to determine the amount of capture reagent, uh, determine what capture reagent, and then the amount so that you are in that linear range. You need to optimize the parameters of the mass specs, such as the collision energy. Uh, you can increase the sensitivity by uh, scheduling the retention times, as well as uh, identify any mat matrix interferences, etc. Once all of these uh, are done, then you go into the assay validation stage where you uh, make sure that the calibration curves and qual uh, quality check standards uh, are, are meeting the specs. After that, you can use a routine workflow, which is the immobilization of the antibody on the beads, or in this case, we use the SMAP Bravo, so we use the streptavidin cartridges, followed by affinity purification of the samples in solution triptych digest. Uh, after overnight digestion, we spike the heavy labeled peptides, uh, perform a reverse phase desalting or cleanup again on the Bravo, and then uh, do the LCM SMS analysis on the triple quad system. Um, this is the routine workflow that a mm, lot of labs use for peptide quant. Uh, Two main things I want to stress here is the use of the automation that really helps with the robust and reproduce, robustness and reproducibility of the assays, and second, uh, making sure that you use uh, the peptides that are, you know, that behave good and have good ionization efficiency. That really helps, and having not only the qu uh, quantitative peptides but also a quality check helps you make sure that you are getting the best results. Here I'm showing a quantitative uh, assessment example for an ADC. Unlike large molecules, uh, monoclonal antibodies, which has just one readout of the antibody as a PK measurement, ADCs have different components to it. We use one workflow to generate three different data sets, the total antibody, conjugated drug, as well as the free drug. For an ADC, uh, in order to understand the PK behavior, you need to know the total antibody readout as well as the ADC readout. Ideally, for a stable ADC, both of these readouts should go hand in hand. 
However, if it is an unstable, you would see a gap where the ADC would kind of go down uh, and, and the ratio of the total antibody to ADC would change, which is suggestive of the unstability. The free drug exposure is a readout that is many times used for tox studies to understand the tox findings and correlate with the circulating free payload in the plasma. So in this case, the workflow involves uh, any in vivo samples uh, along with the ADC standard curves will go through protein A purification. On the robotic platform that I had shown before, instead of using streptavidin cartridges, we use the protein A cartridges. After the protein A purification, we split the samples into triptych digestion to get the total antibody readout and use the papain or cathepsin release, force release of the payload. These enzymes uh, cleave the linker at the dipeptide and releases the payload. And then we monitor the conjugated drugs. So the LCMS analysis is for the small molecule. Um, and this would be the surrogate of the ADC um, PK. So this is how we measure these two readouts. We also save the flow-throughs and then use that for the free drug assessment. So on the right side here on the top, I'm showing an ADC-X mouse PK study. This was a pretty stable ADC. And here in the three different colors, I'm showing blue, which is the total ADC LCMS. Red is the total ADC using LBA. And on top of each other, so this is using two different techniques, you still get the same pretty similar results. And green is the conjugated drug data, which is overlapping pretty good with this total antibody suggestive of the stability of the ADC. On the bottom right side here is the ADC-Z, which is the data from the Sinotox uh, study. Here you can see the red, which is the total antibody, and the black, which is the ADC profile. Uh, as time increases, the gap between the two increases, suggestive of some instability. On the the other cartoon here, or the figure or, uh, that I'm showing here, is the readout of the free drug. You can see there is an increase in the free drug earlier in the time points, and then it kind of goes down. So these are the typical readouts that you would want to have uh, for uh, PK and TOC studies for an ADC. And I've one more thing I wanted to highlight is on the bottom ADCZ, this was a non-cleavable ADC, and hence for the ADC assay, the capture was using the anti-drug uh, capture. Uh, this was a program that went into the de development, and hence we had availability of the anti-drug capture. So just, just one example to showcase all the different assays that can be used for an ADC quantitative assessment. Okay, reaching towards the end of my talk, I want to summarize my findings. Uh, both qualitative and quantitative bioanalysis uh, enables interpretation of stability, pharmacokinetic uh, behavior, as well as biotransformation of ADCs using LCMS-based approaches. The use of high-resolution Bruker Maxis uh, QTOF aids in both of these type of bioanalysis of ADCs. I can't stress the importance of using Bruker Maxis QTOF because of its 80,000 resolution as well as monoisotopic mass resolution up to 60,000 uh, molecular weight. So this is really helpful in, in studying all these small changes or biotransformation for ADCs. At the end, combining both of these techniques, qualitative and quantitative assessment using LCMS, really is the key to address today's bioanalytical challenges, making it a valuable tool for ADC discovery and development. I would like to end my talk by acknowledging all the different teams and folks without whom this, all of this work would not have been possible. So starting with my own team, Protein Science and Analytics, uh, uh, Discovery Chemistry, from which we got all the payloads and linker drugs, Process Science, Bioconjugation, and the mass spec team, um, Antibody Discovery, uh, In Vivo Pharmacology, Toxicology Group that provided us all the in vivo samples, uh, DMPK folks, uh, and uh, last but not the least, I would like to acknowledge Guillaume, uh, who was really a great resource uh, that helped us with all the Bruker mass spec questions. 
optimizations as well as software uh, questions. So thank you everyone for your attention.